Welcome to Mikon's hardware. The X99 or LJ2011 version 3 platform is getting deprecated very fast. If you are looking to build a budget-friendly gaming computer, then Core i3-12100 is the best option for you. This quad-core CPU is able to beat any Xeon E5 V3 V4 CPU in gaming. But how about workstation and productivity? Lately I see that more and more people start to reason in terms of cores. For example, some believe that Xeon E5-2666 V3 is better than Core i5-12400 for workstations just because Xeon has 10 cores and i5 has 6 cores. The comparison doesn't work this way and you can't compare the core numbers without taking into account the overall CPU performance. And this is what we are going to explore in this video. It happened that I have got E5-2666 V3, E5-2696 V3 and AMD Ryzen 7 1700X on my hands at the same time. Since all of these CPUs are very attractive for budget workstation builds, I thought it would be nice to get a comparison between three of them. Additionally, to make this video even more interesting, I'm going to add results of Core i5-12400, but unfortunately these are not my own results. I had to gather these results from internet, and even though I have used more or less reputable sources, I need to warn you that some of the results might not be very accurate or not very much comparable to my tests. Nevertheless, I believe this is enough to understand the gap between a modern 6-core CPU and the old Xeon E5 CPUs. First, let's quickly go through the test bench configuration. For the Xeon E5 CPUs, I have used Quanon GX99TF version 2.0 motherboard, 32 gigs of RAM, 4x8, Samsung DDR4-2133 CL14. Both of the CPUs were Turbo Boost unlocked, E5-2666 V3 had voltage adjustment as set to minus 60 minus 50 millivolts, and E5-2696 V3 had the voltage set to minus 80 minus 50 millivolts. Exactly these voltages I have picked because this is the best stable configuration I was able to achieve with my CPUs. Ryzen 7 1700X was tested using ASRock B450M Steel Legend motherboard, also 32 gigs of RAM, 4x8, G-Skill DDR4-2133 CL14. The rest of the configuration is identical for all of the CPUs. NVIDIA GTX 1066GB as the graphics card, a couple of SSDs, EVGA Supernova 750P2 power supply, and Windows 11 Pro as the operating system. ADA64 memory test shows us that all three CPUs are not far apart. Sure, quad-channel memory configuration of the Xeon CPUs is slightly faster than dual-channel configuration of Ryzen 7, but Ryzen has 2933 speed, while Xeon E5 has only 2133 speed, so the gap is not that big. It is worth mentioning that Ryzen 7 has worse latency than Xeon E5 CPUs, even though the memory speed is much faster. Xeon E5s respond with a 70 or 71 nanoseconds, depends on the CPU, and Ryzen 7 1700X responds with 76 nanoseconds. The first test, as usual, is Cinebench R23. As expected, 18-core E5-2696 is taking the lead, it is giving us 14,000 points. Then E5-2666 V3 and Ryzen 7 1700X are demonstrating very similar scores, almost 10,000 points. What is interesting is that Core i5-12400 is scoring 12,000 points. It is significantly more than both E5-2666 and Ryzen 7, and it is not that far from 18-core E5-2696 V3. Switching to the single-core results, and we see that Core i5-12400 is simply demolishing all other CPUs. 1700 points is almost double as much as any other CPU is able to score in this test. E5-2666 has only 828 points, 2696 scores 864 points, Ryzen 7 1700X in the stock configuration 898 points, and overclocked it gives us 989 points. Geekbench 5 is another synthetic benchmark that shows us a very similar picture, but here i5-12400 is not able to match E5-2666 V3. This time, i5 is slightly faster than Ryzen 7, but still slower than 10-core E5-2666 V3. Of course, 18-core E5-2696 V3 is taking the lead. 
Switching to the single core results, and again, 2666 takes the last spot, 2696 is slightly better, Ryzen 7 1700X is slightly better again, and i5-12400 is miles ahead. 7-zip compression. Here, 6-core 12400 and 10-core E5-2666 demonstrating identical performance. 60,000 MIPS. 18-core E5-2696 V3 has 96,000 MIPS. Ryzen 7 1700 is stock and overclocked gives us 44 and 47,000 points. 7-zip decompression is slightly different. Here, i5-12400 is not able too much E5-2666 V3 and Ryzen 7. Sure, 18-core E5-2696 V3 is significantly faster than any other CPU. Google Tesseract recognizes text from a picture. This is a single-core test, thus unsurprisingly 12400 is almost twice as fast as any of the CPU. It completes the test in just 40 seconds. Both of the Xeons are taking more than 80 seconds to complete the test, and Ryzen 7 1700 completes it in about 65 seconds. Some more synthetic tests. SuperPi. Interestingly enough, here Ryzen 7 takes the last spot. It completes the test in 840 milliseconds. Xeon E5 CPUs are completing the same test in about 600 milliseconds, and i5-12400 is much faster, 421 milliseconds. W Prime is able to use all CPU cores, so E5-2696 V3 is the fastest. It completes the test in 61 milliseconds. E5-2666 completes the test in 94 milliseconds, then i5-12400 and Ryzen 7 1700X are taking about 110 milliseconds to complete the test. And even more synthetic tests. Stockfish. Here i5-12400 and e5-2666 V3 are identical. Ryzen 7 1700X is slightly slower, and 18-core e5-2696 V3 is faster, but not that much faster. OpenSSL is another single-core test, so as expected i5-12400 is taking the first place. The other CPUs are about the same. Web browser performance. In particular, I'm testing Google Octane, WebXPRT, and Speedometer 2.0. In all three tests, E5-2666 V3 is the slowest. E5-2696 V3 is slightly faster, Ryzen 7 1700X is even faster. But i5-12400 is again miles ahead of all the other CPUs. VRA 5. This test uses all CPU cores to render a scene and shows us how many rays were rendered in one minute. E5-2696 V3 takes the lead. It scores more than 11,000 rays. On the second place, we find i5-12400, which is able to render 9300 rays, which is rather surprising, because e5-2666 V3 and the Ryzen 7 1700X are only able to render somewhere around 7600 rays. In this test, 6-core i5 is able to significantly beat 10-core Xeon E5. Blender test is also able to use all CPU cores, Thus, E5-2696 V3 is yet again at the top, 243 points. Core i5-12400 takes the second spot again, 170 points. E5-2666 V3, 161 points. Ryzen 7 1700X, 144 and 156 points, it depends on the configuration. Corona Benchmark is yet another multi-core rendering test. E5-2696 V3 completes the test in just 76 seconds i5-12400 and e5-2666 V3 take about 120 seconds, and Ryzen 7 1700X is consuming more than 130 seconds. Video encoding. Using SVT-AV1 and DAV1D tests, we see that Core i5-12400 is the fastest CPU. The next place goes to e5-2696 V3, not far behind is e5-2666 V3, and further behind, on the last place, we find Ryzen 7 1700X. Using Quasar test, the picture changes a little bit. E5-2696 V3 takes the first spot, i5-12400 takes the second spot. The rest of the configuration doesn't change. Finally, let's talk about the power consumption. Using Cinebench R23, I have measured anti-system power consumption. 
Using all CPU cores, a system with E52696 V3 consumes about 235 watts. System with E52666 V3 consumes 215 watts. You may ask how this happens that 10 and 18 core CPUs are consuming roughly the same amount of power, and I will answer. Both of these CPUs have TDP limitation of 145 watts. Overclocked Ryzen 7 1700X is taking about 204 watts. Stock configuration of Ryzen 7 1700X is 170 watts, and Core i5 12400 is only 161 watts. Switching to the single core results, I unfortunately do not have uh, the value for i5 12400 because I didn't find it online, but I have tested my configurations. E5 2696v3 system consumes 100 watts, E5 2666v3 85 watts, and Ryzen 7 1700X somewhere around 75 watts. Looking at points per watt, we see that Core i5 12400 is the champion. It is able to score almost 75 points per single watt of electricity. The next place goes to E5 2696v3, it scores about 60 points per watt. Then we have Ryzen 7, stock configuration 52 points per watt, and overclocked 47 points per watt. The last place goes to E5 2666V3, it scores only 45 points per watt. As you can see, Turbo Boost unlocked Xeons pushed to the maximum turbo on all CPU cores are really inefficient. The single core results are slightly different though. E5 2696V3 has maximum turbo of 3.8 GHz and at this speed the efficiency goes away. The CPU scores only 8.6 points per watt. E5 2666V3 is slightly better, with 9.7 points per watt. And Ryzen 7 1700X scores almost 12 points in the stock configuration and almost 14 points in the overclocked configuration. With these results, all of you can make your own conclusion about what CPU is the best for you and what platform to choose. My takeaway will be the following. If you can afford buying Core i5 12400, do that. Even though the CPU has only 6 physical cores, it is equally good for productivity and gaming. On the other hand, if you need 40 PCI Express lanes and you want to have lots of cheap ECC DDR4 memory, then the X99 platform is still relevant. You can get the cheap Xeons, the cheap Chinese motherboards. Then, if you cannot afford buying Core i5 and you do not need 40 PCI Express lanes, then take a look at the AMD AM4 platform and the first or second gen AMD Ryzen CPUs. For example, 8 core Ryzen 7 1700X is performing about the same as 10 core E5 2666v3, but it is significantly more efficient. At the same time, you are getting a much better motherboard. AMD AM4 motherboards are having upgraded USB connectivity. You are getting an official motherboard with official support, official drivers, much better BIOS. And what's more important, you are getting a very good upgrade path. In the future, you will be able to upgrade to Ryzen 9 5950X or Ryzen 9 5900X, or at least Ryzen 7 5800X. Right now, even the oldest AMD B350 motherboards are getting support for these modern Ryzen CPUs. But of course, when you're buying a motherboard, you need to check the manufacturer website to see that your motherboard will actually support some future upgrades. Additionally to these, I can add the following. Those who bought expensive X99 motherboards and cheap E5 2640 or E5 2666v3 CPUs with an upgrade in mind, hoping to install 2696 or 2699v3 with 18 cores and double or triple their performance, will probably be very disappointed. Even though E5 2696v3 comes with 3.8 GHz maximum turbo and 18 physical cores, it still has 145 Watt TDP limitation. With this limitation, these 18 cores will not be able to achieve 3.8 GHz. With my testing, the CPU runs at somewhere between 2.9 and 3.1 GHz when loaded. Sure, I have seen those videos where people uh, reduce the voltage even further and demonstrate that if i2696 v3 is able to achieve even higher scores, but I have to say that this is not very correct because the system is not 100% stable in this configuration. 
For example, my CPU is able to run with minus 90 or even minus 100 millivolts offset, but in this configuration the system is not 100% stable. When you build a workstation, you need stability, and that's the most important factor. That's why I believe that I need to pick a stable configuration and show you these results. Of course, I could do my benchmarks and when the system crashes, I just restart computer and continue the benchmarking again, collect the numbers and present you, but that would be rather misleading. AMD AM4 platform is also not flawless. For example, using the first gen Ryzen 7 1700X with my expensive G-Scale modules that are equipped with the Samsung B die memory chips, I was not able to go any faster than DDR4 2933 if I install four memory sticks. I know for sure that my memory is able to run a DDR4 3400 sale 14, but with the Ryzen 7 1700X that's not possible. Overclocking these CPUs is also almost impossible and almost pointless. For example, to keep my Ryzen 7 1700X at 3.9 GHz, I need to increase the voltage to 1.4 volts. This is rather much, and my ASRock B450M motherboard simply gives up and the VRM starts to throttle. So, all in all, by in Ryzen you're getting better platform, you're getting better efficiency, but don't expect that the performance will be automatically much better than the old Xeons, because it won't. As you have probably guessed, I cannot give you the universal answer saying by this, not that, this platform is better than that platform. It all depends. It depends on what you want, it depends on what you need, and it depends on how much money you're willing to spend for this particular workstation. But I hope that my results are going to help you make your decision, make the right decision, and pick what you actually need. For now though, thanks for watching, thanks for listening, I hope it was interesting, bye bye.